Well, a uh, very pleasant day to you all. Dave Fisher with you here at USA Hockey Headquarters in Colorado Springs on a joyous day. As uh, just a couple of hours ago, we announced a new list of hockey immortals that will rightfully take their place at the uh, U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame in Eveleth, Minnesota. And uh, in just a moment, you'll have a chance to hear from them, and they'll be happy to take your questions. But as we begin today, I'd like to uh, turn the proceedings over to the Executive Director of USA Hockey, Mr. Pat Kelleher. Pat? Hello, Dave. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Um, sadly, I'd, I'd like to start off on a, a somber note and ask us all to continue to keep the Gaudreau family in our thoughts and prayers. Uh, as certainly we're all aware, Johnny and Matthew Gaudreau's lives ended way too soon, uh, just a week ago, and both were a big part of our hockey family. So we continue to to, to send our, our, our love and support for the Gaudreau family. Uh, and I know the outpouring of, of support from the, across the hockey community has been been amazing um, as usual, but uh, hopefully we can all gain some comfort from reflecting on the wonderful contributions to our sport that both Johnny uh, and Matthew made while they were with us. So I want to make sure I'd started with that for everyone today. Thank you. Um, today is otherwise and always a great day on the calendar when we announce the next group of immortals to be enshrined in the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame. Uh, another extraordinary class has been selected and you'll hear from them in just a moment, but on behalf of our on our, our all the fans and hockey fans in our country and our president Mike Trimboli um, and everyone involved with USA Hockey and the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame Museum, we'd like to extend a, a warm congratulations to Matt Cullen, Brianna Decker, the late Frederick McLaughlin, Kevin Stevens, and the gold medal winning 2002 Paralympic sled hockey team as our class of 2024 in the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame. From gold medals on the Olympic and Paralympic stage to Stanley Cup championships, this class has impacted our sport in extraordinary ways that will continue to be felt for generations to come. And we look forward to formally enshrining this class on the night of December 4th in the great city of Pittsburgh. That evening, we'll also honor the recipient of the yet-to-be-named 2024 winner of the NHL's Lester Patrick Trophy. USA Hockey is extremely proud to be the caretaker of the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame, and I'd also like to thank the board members of the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame Museum in Eveleth, Minnesota, for their work in helping to preserve the history of our sport through the museum. I'd also like to thank the selection committee that 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 worked so hard to, to select this class and all the work that they do in the background for USA Hockey uh, and, and the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame as well. And finally, congratulations again to our class of 2024. We look forward to celebrating you and appreciate and respect all the things that you've done for our game over the years. Thanks, Dave. All right, Pat. Thanks very much. Um, and as we get started, just a reminder uh, that this is the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame, not the USA Hockey Hall of Fame, the country's trying, um, not the organizations and uh, as Pat, Pat mentioned, we're proud to be the caretaker today of uh, an institution that was started by a bunch of hockey enthusiasts up in Eveleth, Minnesota, back in the late 60s. First class was enshrined in 1973, and this will be the 52nd class to take its rightful place uh, in the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame up in Eveleth. We're going to take uh, the class in alphabetical order. We'll finish with the sled team. And you'll have a chance to hear from each member of the class. I'll give a little brief introduction, and then they'll be happy to take your questions. Uh, we will start with someone uh, that had an extraordinary 21-year career in the National Hockey League, We're playing for eight different teams, three Stanley Cup championships, two with the Pittsburgh Penguins, one with the Carolina Hurricanes, one of only two American-born players to play more than 1,500 games in the regular season in the NHL. And, of course, um, he also had a terrific career at St. Cloud State University, where he is in the uh, SCSU Athletics Hall of Fame and had his jersey uh, retired there as well. On the international stage, he was a member of Team USA five different times, highlighted by helping our country earn bronze at the 2004 IIHF uh, Men's World Hockey Championship from Moorhead, Minnesota. A great pleasure to welcome in the first member of the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame class of 2024, Mr. Matt Cullen. Cully, congratulations. The floor is yours. Thanks, Fish. Appreciate it. Um, man, it's just quite a quite an honor to be a part of this. This is a fantastic class. Um, and it's just a huge honor for me. Uh, and it's especially, uh, 
great being uh, having the ceremony in Pittsburgh. So it'll be a special, uh, special event. But I'm just super honored and humbled to be a part of this. So thanks. All right. Thanks a lot, Matt. Um, we move on to the next member of our class and nothing but success has followed her on uh, her great career, not only on the playing surface, but now in the coaching realm, uh, 15 year run with the U S women's national team program highlighted, no doubt by the helping team USA earn gold at the 2018 Olympic winter games, two other Olympic medal performances, part of her resume, she helped the U.S. to six gold medals at the IHF Women's World Championship and also the first two gold medals ever awarded in the IIHF Under-18 Women's World Championship uh, at Wisconsin. She helped the Badgers to the 2011 National Championship on the uh, professional stage, a two-time NWHL MVP and helped Boston to the Isabel Cup title. And now in her coaching career, four times she has helped uh, the U.S. earned medals at the IHF Under-18 Women's World Championship, including a, a pair of gold medals. A great pleasure to welcome in uh, the next member of the class of 2024 from Dousman, Wisconsin, the great Brianna well, Decker. Dex, welcome, and uh, the floor is yours. Congratulations. Awesome. Thank you, Fish. Um, congratulations to you, Matt, as well, and the other um, inductees. But um, obviously, super honored to be a part of this class. Um, and you know, you start hockey at a young age and you don't think about things like this. You just follow the path and follow the journey. And so it's a pretty surreal moment being inducted. So thank you. All right. Thanks, Brianna. Um, next up in the class of 2024 is the late Frederick McLaughlin. And when we think about hockey in uh, Chicagoland in the Midwest today, we think of it in a robust and thriving fashion. And that was not always the case. It was back in 1926 that Frederick McLaughlin founded the NHL's Chicago Blackhawks. Fast forward eight years later, uh, and Chicago won its first Stanley Cup title in 1934, and then a second Stanley Cup title in 1938. And uh, Frederick McLaughlin was always an ardent supporter of American players and coaches at a time, frankly, when that was not the quote unquote, in thing to do. As a matter of fact, on that 1938 Stanley Cup winning team, there were eight American born players. And that is the most American born players. Uh, that record stood all the way up until 1995 when the New Jersey Devils uh, had 12 American born players on its 95 Cup team. Uh, the impact that he left behind, we still feel positively today in our sport. He was posthumously enshrined in the Hockey Hall of Fame in 1963. And we are just delighted to have representing him here today, his granddaughter, Castle, who joins us from uh, Greater Boston. And Castle, so, welcome, welcome. Warm congratulations to uh, your grandfather, you and the family. Thanks for being here. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Dave. And congratulations to all the other inductees. So I am representing the descendants of Frederick McLaughlin, who died in 1944. That was many years before I was even born, but I, we do know that he was passionate about promoting hockey, especially the Blackhawks. And as you mentioned, he had a particular interest in um, advocating for American born players. And I know he'd be very honored to be part of this class. So I'd like to thank the selection committee and everyone who had anything to do with um, including him in the class, and I'm thrilled to represent him in his absence. Thanks so much, Castle, for being here. And uh, again, warm congratulations. Uh, the next member of our class, when you think of the word or the term, I guess, power forward, uh, you certainly think of him and what a spectacular uh, playing career. 15 years in the National Hockey League, uh, two Stanley Cups, 11 years with the uh, Pittsburgh Penguins where those Cups came to reality. Uh, harken back to 1991-92, 123 points in the National Hockey League, second only in the league to his teammate Mario Lemieux. And of course, at the time, that was the most points ever recorded by an American-born player in the league. A year later, another 100-point season, 55 goals. This campaign, the most ever recorded by an American-born player, and that record stood for an awful long time. A matter of fact, just a couple of years ago, uh, it was eclipsed back in 2022 by 
Austin uh, Matthews. Great career up in Chestnut Hill at Boston College, helped the Eagles to the NCAA tournament all four years uh, he was there. And of course, his international stage uh, career highlighted by being a part of the 1988 U.S. Olympic men's ice hockey team. And he was also the captain of the bronze medal winning 1996 uh, U.S. men's national team at the World Championship from Pembroke, Massachusetts. A warm congratulations and welcome to the next member of our class of 24, Mr. Kevin Stevens. Kevin, congratulations. And the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks. Mr. Uh, much appreciated. I like to say, uh, Congratulations to the all the other inductees. It's uh, it's quite an honor, you know. It was kind of one of those things that, you know, I played with a lot, a lot of great players, and um, to have the opportunity to go in with these this class here and just be able to, um, I don't know, it's been, it's been a long, you know, it was a it's a great long run of playing with great players, and the only reason I'm really going in there because I have played with great players and I had the opportunity to do that. So, but. Very honored and glad. I'm so happy it's in Pittsburgh. It's going to be, it's a great city. We'll have a great time there. The fans love hockey, so I can't wait to get uh, get back there in December. It'll be a great time. All right. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Um, and we finished with the 2002 Paralympic sled hockey team. It's a miracle on ice like story to the gold medal uh, for that group. We think back to 1994 when sled hockey was introduced the Paralympics, uh, the United States did not field a team. Four years later in Nagano, the U.S. was sixth of seven teams in sled hockey in the Paralympics. And then in the World Championship, the year before the 2002 uh, Paralympic Games in Salt Lake City, the U.S. finished dead last in the World Championship. And the only reason our team was in uh, the Paralympic Tournament in Salt Lake City is because we were the host nation. Uh, but that mattered little to first-year head coach Rick Middleton and the uh, collective group of 15 athletes that made up that spectacular team started uh, with a shout out of Japan, beat uh, gold medal favorite Canada five to one, beat defending champion Norway. And the first three games went on to beat Sweden and Estonia. And that set up the gold medal rematch with uh, with Norway. We got up three to one in the game. Norway came back to tie it, sent it to overtime. And then it was decided ultimately in a shootout and with the goaltending of Manny Guerrero and ultimately the game-winning goal heroics of Kip St. Germain scored in the fourth row, the deciding goal, the U.S. did the unthinkable and uh, won the gold medal in Salt Lake City. And it is a big thrill to have with us today representing that team, Kip St. Germain himself, who scored that deciding goal. Kip, congratulations, warm congratulations to you and your team, and uh, please take it away. Thanks, Dave. Um, on behalf of my 2002 teammates, I want to congratulate the rest of the class of 2024. Uh, it's a tremendous honor to be inducted with them and, and the others. Um, it's been a, a thrill and a, an incredible journey, and, and it continues to grow, and we're just excited to uh, be a part of it. Awesome. Thanks very much, Kip. And uh, the assembled news media, the uh, class will be happy to take your questions now. We'll use the raise hand function. And when we call on you, please identify yourself uh, and your affiliation and who your question is directed to. I will also mention that uh, Brianna is in the middle of tryouts at Chaddock St. Mary's and has a hard stop at 1230. And I know uh, Matt has some family things too here that uh, he's going to be done here in about a uh, half hour. So if we can Make sure we get your questions for them. That would be helpful. We'll start with Chris Miller. And uh, Mills, welcome. Glad to have you. Your mic is open. Go ahead, Chris. You should be ready to go. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Enough about Matt Cohen. Let's talk about me. When I was a young reporter working in Virginia, Minnesota at the Masabi Daily News, um, Terry Cullen was the high school coach in Virginia. Taught me everything I know about hockey, which I later translated to Michael Russo. But Matt, you were like, what, two or three years old back in 1981, 82, whenever that was. What were early memories of hockey um, starting on Virginia and then moving over to Moorhead? Yeah, some great memories. Uh, that's funny. We were actually just in Virginia. My my two younger boys played on our Bantam team in Moorhead. We actually had our region tournament at the new Rock Ridge Arena. So it was kind of fun being back there. I haven't been back in, in quite a while, but... Some great memories. Yeah, my dad coached the high school team, I think, for, I want to say, 10, 11 years up there. And um, it was a great place to grow up. I have, you know, two younger brothers and a younger sister. And we spent a lot of time on the outdoor rink there. And we went to the the, uh, uh, the Miners Memorial Auditorium and watched uh, quite a few high school games and spent a lot of time in the locker room. And 
probably where where I guess my own love of the game started um, watching the Blue Devils and uh, cheering for those guys and just being a part of the youth hockey in Virginia. And then we moved to Moorhead in 86 when I was about uh, 10 years old. And um, another great place to grow up. And again, like a lot of really good kids to grow up around and played a lot of hockey, a lot of outdoor rink stuff. And my dad was a high school coach there. So kind of grew up always just wanting to play on the high school team. I never really thought much past that. Um, but some great memories, uh, both spots. All right. Thanks, Chris. That was um, Chris Miller from the Star Tribune in Minneapolis. I think it's a new name. Minnesota Tribune now, Melzi. Is that right? We are the Minnesota Star Tribune. We're going to be starting, getting, covering Moorhead, Virginia, Albert Lee, you name it. Okay. Very good. Thank Thanks, you. Chris. Appreciate it. Uh, next, we'll go to uh, Stephen Wino. Mr. Wino, welcome. Glad to have you. Please go ahead. Thanks, Fish. I'll start with you, Brianna, since you have to go in a little bit. How proud are you, not just of the gold medal in 2018, but just being a part of this generation of the U.S. Women's National Team and what you're able to do for, for, for growing the sport in the U.S. and beyond? Yeah, um, you know, honestly, it's like I, I look at my career and when I got on the national team um, consistently back in 2010-11, I was, you know, I played, I had opportunity to play with Angela Ruggiero and Julie Chu, and, you know, those guys made such an impact on, the game um, early on. And so, you know, I think our, our generation of players made it a, made a pact that we would try to raise the bar and continue to do the same thing and impact the game as much as possible. And so being a part of that was obviously super special. Um, and then kind of coming full circle, going back to Shattuck and coaching, um, I just take, you know, responsibility to try to impact the kids here and, you know, make their development um, impactful and hopefully that they can go and obviously, uh, play for the U.S. team one day or play for the Olympics, um, you know, for either it's U.S. or Canada. But, um, you know, I think these young girls um, soak up every little information uh, just as I did when I was playing. And so it's super fun to be able to impact them. And for, for Kevin, I, I got a question about you and then and also a question about what, what – uh... Pat brought up earlier, um, a kind of off the ice, how proud are you kind of of your life and, and kind of what you, what you're meant, you've meant to, to hockey and everything beyond your hockey career. And, and also kind of the, the, the deaths of Johnny and Matthew Goudreau, your, just your thoughts on the Boston college community and, and kind of how tough this last week's been. Yeah. The, the last week has been awful. You know, that, that was one of the worst things I've heard in a long, long time when I woke up Friday morning and it's just gut wrenching something like, you know, it's just, just, it's unimaginable something that you know you never want to have to try to deal with and you know we we all come together and try to do the best we can to to, to make this you know you know go by somehow but it's just it's just one of the worst things and it's just a gut wrench when something like that happens a tragedy like this where it's so senseless and it's so like irresponsible and senseless act that, that something like this happened and you know you just don't get over things like this this is going to affect a lot of people and myself for a long time like you know I, even though i didn't know johnny is a little bit younger than me i didn't know him as well you know i knew to say hello to him and stuff like that but the whole the whole tragedy with him and his brother it's just just really really senseless act and then when something like that happens it's it's such a tragedy and uh it's gonna be a tough one you know that's a hard one that's gonna that's gonna wear on wear, wear on us for a long time but um and the other thing off all the off the ice stuff is you know it's just kind of it's really who who I am now, you know. That's what I kind of do, you know. Hockey, I love working for the Penguins and stuff like that. But the addiction stuff and and trying to help people that have been through the, the, the you know, I've been through this through the through the grind kind of, I guess you can call it. But I came out the other side, and you know, I just try to help people and do my best every day to try to if I if I can help one person a day out there, and then I'm doing my job. So it's just kind of the off all the off ice stuff is great and. It's kind of what I think why God kept me around here anyway. So that's that's my main objective is is to try to help people get better. And then the mm -hmm. hockey stuff is great too. So I, I, have, I have two things going on pretty good that I'm I'm pretty happy with. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Stephen. Let's go to uh, Todd Molesky next. Todd, your mic should be open. Please go ahead. Welcome. Thanks, Fish, and congrats to uh, all of you, uh, Brianna, my questions for you, um, Todd Molesky with the Wisconsin State Journal. Sorry if I didn't introduce, introduce myself there. Um, 
I, I wonder if you can share some of your journey through your younger years in hockey here in Wisconsin and how that helped shape you and what some of the, I guess, obstacles you had to overcome were and how maybe you see that your work now is helping prevent some of those obstacles from stopping other girls here in Wisconsin from having the opportunity to play. Yeah, I mean, obviously, girls hockey when I was growing up wasn't much of a thing. Um, I played boys hockey for the Waukesha Warhawks growing up. Um, I had three brothers, so that obviously helped get me involved with hockey. And I was used to playing with boys. And so fortunately enough, um, the boys treated me like one of them. And I, you know, obviously accepted that and I loved it. And, you know, I think playing with the boys growing up made me um, as competitive as um, as can be, honestly, I think, um, rather it was on the rink with them or playing with my brothers in street hockey. It was like, I couldn't get away from that compete level, but, um, you know, I think starting up my endowment fund and helping, uh, girls hockey all over the U S especially, um, in Wisconsin was a goal of mine after I, you know, towards the end of my career, uh, simply because I went back to Wisconsin after living all over the country. And, um, I was like, wow, like it really needs some help. And there's been, there was a little bit of loss of, um, you know, concentration on girls hockey and the growth of the game in Wisconsin. So um, starting that up, I just, you know, obviously wanted to help the girls um, feel comfortable um, if they didn't feel comfortable playing with the boys. And, you know, some girls want to play just for fun and some want to get to the next level. And so I feel like um, I'm trying to help. <clears throat> I'm helping that um, that lane or that alley or whatever way they want to take. So, um, you know, obviously super proud being from Wisconsin and um, you know, now that I live in Minnesota, I sure miss that state, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm doing okay here and over in Minnesota. All right, Todd, thanks very much. Michelle, you're up next. Welcome. Please go ahead. Thanks, Fish. Congratulations to everyone. Um, but me being out of Pittsburgh, I have a couple questions for Cully and Artie. Um, just wanted to ask you both uh, if you could try and put into words maybe the impact your time in Pittsburgh had on you both both on and off the ice. Let's okay. see. Let's just start. Artie, go ahead. You want me to go? Okay. Uh, yeah, Pit, like Pittsburgh was everything to me. You know, was, Pittsburgh was where I came. That came in as a young player. You know, out of um, out of Boston College, I went to the Olympic team in 1988, and after the Olympics, I went into Pittsburgh, and that's where I kind of started my NHL career and that's that's where I became that's where I became the player I became I you know we started with Mario was already there and I came in there and they started to build a team and I played with Johnny Collin and Mark Recchi for a for a while and they were friends of mine it was just Pittsburgh was you know I I loved Pittsburgh so much it was the start of my career I love I love being there we had a great bunch of guys you know Craig Patrick built a great team you know we had Bob Johnson was there our coach it's just Things just seemed to fall in place for me there, and and I, I got to play with some great players, and and then we started to build the championship teams in the early '90s. So, yeah, Pittsburgh was was the start of my my life basically. You know, I was in college in the Olympic team, but really, you know, becoming a man and being in that city when I was, it was just just a great time. I I love Pittsburgh. I still love Pittsburgh, but but my early years in Pittsburgh and my early career were that's where I kind of started. Really. Yeah, same same for me. I mean, I obviously I was at a different point in my career when I got to Pittsburgh. Um, but I know I wouldn't be sitting here if I if I guess if Jim Rutherford hadn't have brought me to Pittsburgh and uh, give me the opportunity late in my career when you know I was considering finishing up and um, you know to get there and get a chance to play with guys like Sid and, and Gino and Chris Letang and Mark Andre Fleury. It was uh, it was pretty special at, at that point. And um, yeah, I mean. It, it's, it's especially cool that, that this is happening in Pittsburgh for, for me because it's such a special, special place. We, we had so many fun years there. And, you know, the two years we won the cup, I had, you know, my young family, my, my young boys were around the locker room. And uh, it was kind of life coming full circle for me, you know, growing up in a locker room with my dad as a coach. So it was, uh, it, it has always been just a special place for me. And uh, it's, it's just awesome that it, uh, we get to come back for the ceremony. Yeah, and Kali, I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you the boys and what kind of reaction they had <laughs> to this news. Yeah, they were excited. They first they had to check their schedules to make sure they didn't have to miss any games, and then uh, then after that, they were pretty excited that <laughs> that it was it was happening. But um, yeah, I mean, for them, Pittsburgh is is kind of where they grew up, and uh, their their best memories are from Pittsburgh. So 
um, it's, uh, it's really cool. I just, I can still picture them doing their online school at the rink, skating with Ty Hennis uh, at lunchtime and running around the rink, uh, coming into the locker room, not wanting to eat their vegetables or whatever. Uh, it was, it was just some, some really fun times, you know, like they're just some of the best years of my life. Awesome. Thanks guys. Look forward to seeing you here in a, a couple months. Thanks. Thanks, Michelle. Killed eating their vegetables, my golly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, beautiful. Uh, let's uh, go to Mike Morial. Mike, hello and welcome. Hey, Fish, can you hear me? We can, yeah, please go okay, ahead. Okay, great, thanks. Thanks, Dave. Congratulations to, to all the inductees and thanks for doing this. I guess, uh, first off, Kip, um, I'm real curious. Can, can you talk about how uh, Rick Middleton was able to get your group together to accomplish what you were able to do, particularly since, you know, there are 10 Paralympic rookies on the team. And, and if you had any funny stories to share, I'd love to hear them. <laughs> yeah, no, um, bringing Rick on board was a tremendous success for us. Um, you know, it, it brought instant credibility amongst the players, uh, you know, just because of the career that he had in the NHL and then, his knowledge of the game and how he translated it to our game. Uh, he basically worked on us work focused on working on our strengths, using our speed and minimizing our weaknesses. You know, with sled hockey, you can use both hands, but most of us were, we only had one player that was a left-handed shot. Everybody else was right-handed. So we put everything pretty much to the right-hand side and chased it that way and then dump it in and, and went after it. You know, so we, cause the other players would have, the other team would have to be looking over their shoulders to see where we were coming from. So, you know, it was really instrumental bringing him on board um, and, it, you know, it worked out and it was it, it, every camp. There was a, there's a story from every camp and, and it was I enjoyed sitting at the dinner table with, and listening to talk about Rick and his rookie season and things that happened in the NHL and things like that and, and, and what we were doing with our Paralympic team. Thanks, Kip. Uh, Matt, what is your... This is kind of a loaded question, but what is your proudest NHL memory? And and how do you think the league has changed since you played the game? Yeah, well, it's it is a tough, tough question. I guess probably the just each Stanley Cup was uh was different in its own way. I, I mean, those would have to be my my peak moments in the game and just my favorite memories. Just not even so much winning the cup, but just the process of going through it. Um, with each of those teams, they were so different and you just kind of remember the whole, the whole like path along the way, there's so many different ups and downs and you just kind of appreciate your different teammates as you look back on it over the years and all the experiences. So those were probably my favorite memories, just, you know, um, winning the cup, uh, of course, but, um, I know I'm forget what was the first part of your question or the second part? <laughs> oh, yeah. The second part was, I'm just curious your thoughts on, on, you know, how the game, how do you feel that the, yeah. the game has changed since you played? Yeah. You know, I actually, I think the game is in such a great place. I love watching hockey. I probably couldn't say that about the game. Like when I, when I first came into the league and, you know, like 98, it was still prior to the rule changes and, uh, I just think the game has gotten to such a place where it's just focused on skill and speed and it's so fun to watch. Um, I watch the players now and it's so fun when you're coaching young kids to be able to point to the NHL and say, look at how these guys play. Um, look at the skill level, look at the speed, um, the commitment by the players to they, they're all so fit and so fast and so skilled. And it, like, I think the game is in a better place than it's ever been um, at every level. It's uh it's so fun to watch the sport and uh, it, like, it, I got a kind of a unique view of it going through the, the previous style of game and then going through the lockout. And then when we came out on the other side and the focus was on skill and speed, um, you know, it's just been kind of fun to watch the game evolve. And, and, and once that happened, um, man, it's just been no stopping it. The, the amount of skill on the ice is amazing watching the NHL, but, but also watching like young kids, the stuff that they're doing on the ice and the, the skill level they have, it's just awesome. I, I just can't say enough about what a good spot the game is in right now, in my opinion. Thanks, Matt. One more, if I may, Fish. Um, Rihanna, I'm, I'm just curious, who, who was your favorite hockey player growing up and inspired you to play the game? <laughs> um, ironically, it was Yamir Yager. So uh, that was my uh, favorite player. Uh, my parents never played or anything. So like from a 
immediate family standpoint, obviously I looked up to my brothers uh, quite a bit, um, but, and then from a female standpoint, uh, Cami Granado obviously had a huge impact on me as a kid. Um, you know, they won in 98 and I was, you know, seven years old. And so um, that was kind of the re the real dream. Um, obviously I didn't really think I was ever going to play in the NHL. Um, you know, I think some young girls still think they are, but now there's a league that they can play in. So, um, but yeah, those are, those are my people. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And yes, that did translate to Brianna growing up a Penguins fan, right, Dex? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, I know Brianna has to, oh, or she has to go. Um, so if, is, if those of you that have your hands up, if you don't have a question for Brianna, would you put them down? All right, good. All right, Tyler, I'm going to go to you. And uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Dave. Tyler Kuehl, Daily Face up here. This one is for Brianna. Brianna, I, you know, for for many people, they were their eyes were open to women's hockey at the 2019 NHL All-Star Game, which you were a part of, and Kendall Coyne and, and whatnot. How do you think that moment not just elevated your career, but also women's hockey to the point now where we have a fully functioning professional league in the PWHL. Yeah. I mean, that weekend was definitely not intended to do that. I think the NHL obviously brought us in to, you know, get women's hockey exposed a little bit more. And, um, but you know, I think what happened with Kendall and I and all the publicity that we got and, um, you know, I think we, we didn't expect that. And it was, it was incredible. I think for women's hockey, um, you know, I think the one thing that, you know, goes kind of under the radar is how awesome the NHL guys were with, are with us when we're there. Um, they're in full support. Um, a lot of them have younger kids, whether their son, they have sons or daughters. And so they're just so supportive of what we're trying to do and what, um, women's hockey is trying to do. So, um, that was a big moment, and I think it did springboard um, what the league is today. And I think, um, you know, Kendall and Hillary Knight have done um, a huge – have had a huge part in where the league is today. So, obviously, grateful for them and all the other players that had come before um, uh, us as well. So, Awesome. Thank you, Brianna. I have a question for Castle, but I'll get out of the way so if anyone else has questions for Brianna. Okay, let me see here. Let me check with Mr. Morial. Uh, Mike, did you have something more for Brianna before we let her go? I am good, Fish. Thank you. Thanks, Brianna. You're good. Okay. Okay. All right, Brianna, I, uh, thanks for joining us again. Congratulations. No, you got to go. Good luck with the tryouts. Awesome. Thank you, guys. And I'll see you in uh, the rest of you guys in December. Awesome. Thanks. Okay, Tyler, uh, go ahead, please. Yes, uh, this one is for for Castle McLaughlin. And Castle, you know the what your grandfather started with the Blackhawks, obviously started an NHL franchise and really helped the league kind of expand into the Midwest. How does your family feel? How he's not just helped create one of the the standard franchises in the league, but also really helped growing hockey, not just in Chicago but St. Louis and into even places like Iowa and Missouri, all around really that area. Thank you. Um... In truth, we don't know a lot about his hockey life because, unfortunately, he died before myself and my cousins were born. But my father was very proud of that fact and um, also spoke about his father, Frederick, encouraging schools around the Chicago uh, and area to form actual hockey teams in the 1920s and early 30s, my father went to a place called Culver Military Academy. And because of the influence of his father, they started a hockey team there. And Frederick provided all the equipment and uniforms and, and so forth. So I mean, we're very aware of, of his um, passion for hockey and his accomplishments. But he's I, I feel that he sort of went under the radar for a while um, between the point of his death and maybe the 60s and today. So we're grateful that um, people are once again appreciating his accomplishments and 
at, actually what I know about his hockey life, I learned from researchers um, and scholars uh, who, who investigate his hockey life. But I know my father, it was, was very proud of his father's hockey life and accomplishments with the Blackhawks. And actually his mother, I, I understand, had a minor role in helping to design the uniforms. That's awesome. Thank you very much, Castle. Yep, thank you for the question. Thanks, Tyler. All right, Luke, your mic is open. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, Luke Hanlon with uh, USAHockey.com. I have a question for Kip. Um, you know, considering the the lack of success that the U.S. Paralympic team had before 2002, um, how much of a impact do you think playing on home soil in Salt Lake City had on the the success and the run to gold that you guys had? Oh, it was huge. Um, you know, there was five of us: myself, Joe Howard, Manny Garrett, Dave Conklin, who passed in January, unfortunately, and then um, Dan Henderson. We were on the '98 team, the first one to go. Um, in Japan, and we were excited to be there, but you know, came up well short of what the expectations were. So to come home and be able to do it in Salt Lake City and have family and friends, uh, you know, in the stands, and then uh, as we started to win more and more games, see the media start to follow us, you know, the excitement in the village, um, and just the 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 swelling of support that we got being in Salt Lake City um, was. An amazing experience and it, you know it, it's helped you know by winning that gold medal it, it's helped grow the sport here in the country we've had a lot of success you know the 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 next generation the josh pauls the declan farmers the Roy roybles you know are experiencing their success and you know now we're you know pushing that women's sled development team that hopefully they'll have their opportunity to compete in the paralympics at some point um because they deserve that opportunity as well yeah, but um you know that O2 team was was special. We had a lot of fun and and we were just trying to prove to ourselves and to the world that, you know, yes, we were disabled, but we were very capable athletes. Awesome. Thanks, Luke. Uh Kip, what about the I mean, were you nervous in that shootout? I mean, I mean the gold medals on I can't even imagine that. Honestly, no. <laughs> no, come on. No, it was one, it was one of those things. Every camp we would do, you know, we we're always doing shooting drills. And I always had a game going on with, with uh, the assistant coach, Tommy Moulton. You know, I'd, I'd go down, I'd be asking him, you know, where do you want me to put it? Top right, lower left, whatever the case may be. So when I went out for the shoot, I was just like, Tommy, where do you want me to put it? <laughs> and I can't tell you what he said, but, uh, you know, he's just basically put it in the bleeping net. <laughs> and I was like, all right. But no, it, it was <clears throat> that when we got to the shootout, I had confidence in our team at that point. I mean, the 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 overtime was more nerve wracking than the shootout was. Interesting, cool, what a memory. Um, all right, back to Mr. Moriel over at NHL.com. Mike, thanks, Fish. Um, Kevin, I'm just curious. Did you ever think your American record of 55 goals would ever be broken? Yeah, I thought you, you always think um, 55 is a good number. It was a great number, I guess, but um the way these guys can play now and you know, yeah, you know, we all see how these guys train and how all these, the hockey is just, you know, it's just crazy good. You always figured someone was going to come in there and pot, uh, to break it. But uh, yeah, it, it, it was, um, it was nice. It's a, you know, I, I don't even really remember. I had the record till uh, it was broken. You know, that, that, that's how I thought about it. I, I didn't, when Matthews broke it, it was kind of, that's the first time I heard someone say it and I actually forgot about it, but but yeah, the score that, that that was a good amount of goals. But I knew that sooner or later that that was going to get trounced on, and it's been trounced on a couple of times by him. And, and what and what do you think of Austin Matthews? Yeah, you know what what can you say? He's a he's a he's a dynamic goal scorer. You know the guys uh, the guys you know one if not the best goal scorer in the world, he's right up there in the top one or two, three, right in there. But he's um, yeah, he's, he's a, you know, he's such a unique player. He played a lot different game than I played. He, you know, he's, he has the puck. He had the puck a lot more than I did. I was one of the guys that kind of went to the net and, and had like, you know, my sentiment wanted the puck and I kind of went to the net and I, if I got it, I got it. If not, I kind of open up ice for guys, but, but I played a lot different style of game than he played, you know, and that's, that's just, you know, that's just the way it is. Thanks Kevin. And one more here for Castle. Um, 
Castle, th through your research you have done on your grandfather and, and in what you have learned, what to you was the most impressive item from your grandfather's resume? I guess I, could you repeat that? Like what impressed you most about your, what, what has impressed you most about your grandfather when you, when you did all the research and learned about what he had done? I, I haven't done a tremendous amount of research, but I do read articles and books that come out that relate to him. And often uh, researchers will contact me for information so that I know someone's doing research. But honestly, I um, think that the 2017 New York Times article that focused on his campaign to promote American players was something that really I didn't appreciate until I read that article. And I found it amazing that he pursued that for almost 20 years because uh, he was criticized so heavily for it at the time. People thought he was crazy. Um, and he persisted in trying to, you know, in that goal to develop more American players. So I guess I'd have, that would be my answer. Oh, that's great. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Mike. Um, any any further questions, please use the raise hand function. All right, Luke, back to you, Luke. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, question for Matt. Um, you know, so few professional athletes get the chance to play for their hometown teams. I know you had two different stints with the Minnesota Wild. Uh, what was that experience like for you to be able to, to play for, you know, a team from your home state? Yeah, you know, that was something, uh, you know, watching the North Stars growing up, um, playing playing for Minnesota was something that I always wanted to do uh, as a pro, and it was great. It was a great experience. We had some uh, some good teams. We, we, we didn't get to the – we didn't make it to the finals or anything at, uh, with the Wild, but, man, it was a great experience. It was fun. I was a little later in my career, so I could really appreciate, um, you know, just being at home and, and – uh, playing in front of friends and family and um, the experience with the wild was just was fantastic it was a it was a great way like to just really appreciate being a minnesotan and playing in minnesota uh late in my career all right thanks luke um got a question here that somebody wasn't wasn't able to be on the call that wanted me to ask about uh kevin and matt your experience and College hockey and what what that was, how important that was to your overall development. And Colleen, maybe start with you on the St. Cloud front, and then and Kevin over to you on BC. Yeah, St. Cloud was great for me. I was just uh, fresh out of high school and and had two years at St. Cloud, and it was a good experience just as far as like being able to learn the game at a higher level, playing against older guys. Um, it's just a fun fun development level. You know, you have all week to train and practice and we had ice available all day. So we, you know, I'd do breakaways on our goalie for, for hours uh, instead of going to class sometimes, but it was just a fun experience. You know, you're with, uh, with a bunch of guys that have the same goal as far as trying to advance their game. But um, I, I, I love my time at St. Cloud. It was just a great experience. Yeah. I feel the same way. Uh, Boston college was great. It was a great, um, it was a great four years. I went all four years there and, uh, like I said, I came in there as an 18 or 19. I came right out of high school, my own high school, too. And there was, uh, there was no juniors and no prep school hockey week. I came in, you know, as, as an 18-year-old, like a normal freshman. And, and um, had a great, great bunch of players there. Like, played with some great players and had some of them, some of my best friends there. You know, when I when I went to BC, it was this uh, Massachusetts foreign players were there. It wasn't There was no Canadians left. There was nothing. It was all guys I... I actually went with all my friends to the college, you know, because we played together growing up and it was just like most of the best guys out of Boston went to Boston college. And, uh, you know, it was a great experience. BC is a great school. I learned a lot there and I developed a lot, you know, I needed to learn how to skate a little bit. And I think going there and then to the Olympic team, I wasn't, I wasn't a guy that could play in the HL at 18, 19, 20 years old. I needed to, I needed all my development there. And I, I got a lot of that there and, Made great coaching, Lenny Siklarski, and uh, I played with some great players. So it was a very important part of, of my career was my, my college career because I needed to develop and learn how to skate a little bit. And I, I, I got that at Boston College. Awesome. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have no further questions in the queue to our class. 
Again, warm congratulations to the members of the media. Thanks for joining us today. If you have anything further, you know how to reach me here at the office. And uh, it was with great anticipation. We look forward to the formal induction on December 4th in Pittsburgh. More details on that to come later this month. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks.